anybody who's followed uh, my videos over the years has noticed that um, I'm fascinated by the idea of life denial versus life affirmation. Um, it led to you know, a brush with the antinatalist slash ethylist bunch, uh, which was um, interesting and useful, um, but you know, there's only so much one can learn from somebody who has developed essentially a doctrine. You either accept the doctrine or you don't. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't really see any use in that. And it's interesting that um, that inevitably sort of, you, you, you come across this idea of being doctrinaire every step along the way, which is one of the many snares, I guess, in any uh, path one chooses to follow, if you want to call it a spiritual path. Um, or whatever you want to call it. It's, I would call it just a perspective, a point of view. Um, <clears throat> now, I um, had a very sort of brief to and fro with uh, Hover Bobberer in the comment section of the previous video. Um, and um, it's very, very interesting and very sort of um, prescient what he has to say. I'll just um, go over what he said. Um, what if you seek neither to affirm, in quotation marks, or deny, in quotation marks, life, and are suspicious of anyone pursuing either, or of those trying to impose for no apparent reason, um, what did it say? Yeah, no apparent reason, some kind of symmetry between these positions. Okay, now that is a very nuanced, um, I won't even say it's an objection, but it's a nuanced sort of position or a nuanced um, addition to this, a refinement, I would even say, to the, uh, to the um, discussion. In other words, <clears throat> are we faced with a stark choice between life affirmation and life denial? Does it have to be one or the other? And, as he points out, is the only possible alternative to denial or affirmation, an integration of the two. Because <laughs> um, oh. that too, an integration of denial and affirmation becomes a doctrine, doesn't it? <laughs> a snare, something that is an admitted snare. Um, and uh, I just basically said, you're suspicious of this? Why are you suspicious? And he replied, to me, words like the words affirm and deny imply a conclusion rather than an active gathering of information from which one might be formed. Now that's good, <clears throat> um, or I shouldn't say it's good, but that's that seems to be in line with what he had said before. Um, instead of affirming or denying something, how about exploring each one? <clears throat> now. I agree with this. I agree with what he's saying, because if you ask me, the jury is still kind of out on whether or not we can affirm or deny life. Who knows? Um, but I think that, and here's my reason for choosing the sort of, if you want to call it the path of life affirmation, I've only got so much time, <laughs> you know? Um, I, I, you know, I've got what, I'm 50 now, I've got what, if I go by the uh, genealogy of my family, I've got about 35 more years, possibly more, possibly less. People in my family tend to live to be at least in their mid to late 80s. Um, but 35 years to explore and experience and try to integrate into one's life both a life-denying and a life-affirmation type of philosophy or life-affirming philosophy, in that relatively short period of time, or even 85 years is a relatively short period of time, is not necessarily, or isn't, isn't feasible, or isn't always feasible for everybody. <clears throat> and, you know, know thyself, I don't think that I, that 85 years would be enough <laughs> for me to examine both points of view exhaustively. Um, <clears throat> so I have to make a choice. I don't want to just flounder I have to make a choice, but remember, remember my 
idea about a place to stand. This is quite a while ago, but I'm wary of any kind of axiomatic thinking that then um, leads to a doctrinaire position. We've got to remember that our axioms are axioms. They're not facts. So axiomatically, I will say that I'm a life affirmer, but that is an axiom. That that my position is that life is worth living, or life can be made to be worth living. I'll put it that way. <clears throat> this does not mean that I'm saying life is in all cases worth living. Now, what I'm saying is maybe life is worth living, and I'm going to act on the assumption that it is, but I'm not going to forget the fact that I'm making an assumption. Um, now, the interesting thing about this is, is that Indian philosophy and thinking <clears throat> um, is, if you ask me, on a general continuum as compared to most philosophies or most points of view that I've come across in my life, um, is generally life-denying. Generally, it says that this world is a miserable, paltry place with very little in it. And ultimately, what we want is we want to get back to God or get back to Atman or get back to whatever, slough off all of this, this shell that we live in called phenomenal reality. Um, <clears throat> but there are those who say um, there's more to existence than nirvana or samadhi or whatever you want to call it. Um, the wheel of existence in and of itself is, or it can be, a wonderful thing. If you look at it in a certain way, um, that's kind of the assumption behind Tantra. That's why they throw the weird symbols at you, like Kali, um, uh, poems about cannibalistic uh, mendicants meditating beside rotting corpses in the Ganges and things like that. Um, rather than hiding from the horrors of existence, the Tantras kind of throw it right into your face, or at least some schools of Tantra. Um, <clears throat> As I say, not all schools of Tantra think the same way. The, you, you go to a westernized yoga class, and it, that's Tantra, but it seems worlds away from um, sadhus in the cremation grounds in Bengal. Uh, but, you know, whether you like it or not, the, uh, the hair shirt and the bed of nails is part and parcel of it. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, generally, India is life-denying. Buddhism seems to be. Jainism definitely seems to be. <clears throat> um, but there are <laughs> tantric variants of Buddhism and Jainism as well. Um, there's even, I guess, what, what one could call heretical um, Christian tantrics or even Muslim tantrics um, throughout history, um, although they wouldn't have understood what tantra is. You know. um, so, is um, can one actually say that tantra is a life-affirming philosophy? Well, I would say that Tantra is a means to explore life affirmation as a philosophy, as a point of departure. <clears throat> um, Tantra is probably the type of um, life path, I guess, that's probably got the most danger in it. <laughs> um, there are some paths of Tantra that say that you can drink your way to... Uh, communion with God or whatever, uh, I would say that's probably a recipe for disaster. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are those who say it's possible. Who am I to, to deny this? I don't know. I'm not going to try it again. I, I don't, I've only got X number of years in my life. I don't want to pursue a path that I think will probably ruin me. Um, if I decide that I'm going to perform 15 whiskey pujas a day, and hopefully that's going to lead me to, I don't know, what I'm looking for. Um, okay, I understand that it may get me there, but I also understand there's a 99% chance it'll wreck whatever time I've got here on this earth. 
should I pursue this? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I guess, again, that's a decision that one has to make. Is this what I'm going to do with the limited amount of time I've got in my life? Um, and that's why I sort of have not chosen these paths uh, of, you know, extreme asceticism or extreme indulgence, if you want to call it that, or um, extreme anything, um, simply because I, it's not that I don't think that these things can work, it's just that I don't think that I have it in me to get anything out of them. Um, <clears throat> you know, know thyself, right? Um, but if there is enough in Tantra to sort of counteract the general thrust of life-denying uh, thought, which India is known for. India is known to have a pessimistic view of reality. Um, a pessimism that's sort of not ultimately pessimistic. In other words, in the grand scheme of things, we're all gods and we're all headed for nirvana or whatever. No matter what we do, it's inevitable that we'll get there. Um, but Generally, when it comes to actually trying to accomplish anything at all or get anywhere in this life, the only thing we can do is avoid problems. Um, but Tantra says no. <laughs> you can transcend all of these problems. You have to face them all. In, in certain ways, you have to wade right into all these problems. Um, but once you do that, if you accept these problems as part and parcel of the whole deal, there's still an awful lot left. In fact, not just an awful lot left, there's an awful lot for you to work with. In other words, um, given all the horrors of existence, and I don't, I can't think of anywhere on earth where the horrors of existence are more in your face than in India. Um, you know, you see human want and misery and all its nakedness in India more than anywhere else. I suppose the only other place that I could think of would be Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but... You know, pardon my English, India is not just a big shithole. <laughs> India also has means to transcend all of this. Now, I've got a link in the description bar here of a fellow who is a Baba or a Sadhu or a mendicant or perhaps just a renunciant to some sort of holy man at Tarapith in Bengal, which is a place that's known for the most extreme um, sort of tantra that I can think of or that I've found. And somebody's actually made a web page on the whole thing. Um, he's got a very bad facial deformity, perhaps cancer of the face. Um, it's, I won't say that it's a particularly disturbing photograph. It's, and if anything, it, it, I don't know, the fellow seems pleasant to look at. Even it, Like his deformity seems to add to that. But <clears throat> it is kind of a serious affliction that this person has, whether it's benign or malignant, I don't know. Haven't, did, haven't researched, I don't know anything about the guy. But I like the image. Here's a guy who's got lots to complain about. <laughs> um, he lives in India in Bengal, which is a part of India, where he, or Bangla, it's now called, which has got more than enough naked human want to occupy the human mind. I've been to Kolkata, which was then called Calcutta. Um, great place to see naked want. <laughs> um, he's seen this, I'm quite certain, if he lives in Bangla. Um, he's got every reason to feel rather negative about his life, about life in general. But he has possibly, I don't know, I'm just throwing the idea out there, he's found something that has enabled him to transcend all the negatives in his life. Because that's what Tantra says. It says, given all the horrors, given the fact that if God exists, then God is more like Kali than like Vishnu. Um, given all of that, is there scope for making something of this? Is there scope for life affirmation? Um, the photograph that I linked to of Ganesh Baba, I would say would, would answer, maybe. 
he may simply be some guy who's trying to act like a holy man to get enough food in his belly, to get enough people giving him little bits of change so he doesn't die of starvation before he dies of either his disease or natural causes. Such things you see every day in India. Beggars and mendicants who are dressed up in sort of holy costumes, uh, which they then use as a means to beg for alms. He may be that kind of a person. I don't know. Nobody knows, really. <laughs> Except him. That's the way experience works. <clears throat> he might be a tantric um, adept. Maybe. <laughs> it's, it's not something one can rule out. And again, when you, when you sort of say, look, you have to embrace uh, the horrific a aspects of reality. You have to embrace these things. Uh, not so much in order to overcome them, but to just move beyond them a little bit, to say, yes, I accept all of this stuff. In his case, I accept that I live in a very poor part of the world. I accept the fact that there's a very good chance that I'm going to die in agony from my disease. I accept the fact that um, no woman will ever look at me um, with any interest, I guess. Um, I accept the fact that uh, you know I have all these negatives in my life. <clears throat> I'm not saying that this guy is doing that, by the way, that he has achieved this. What I'm saying is, it is possible. <laughs> um, it's not up to me to judge whether or not Ganesh Baba is um, desperately trying to stay afloat in a horrific situation, or if he actually is transcending his limitations. I don't know. I can't know in the very nature of things. <clears throat> but it's possible that he is. Um, I guess I go back to Syadvada, the theory of maybe. Um, ultimately, I don't know whether or not you know, such people are getting anything out of this or get, gaining the benefit that they say they are, but they may be. Um, so again, it's axiomatic thinking as opposed to factual thinking. If I sort of take the axiom that, you know, maybe you can actually transcend the limitations of this universe through Tantra. In other words, we do live in a kind of a horrific universe, but if you make the efforts necessary, which are absolutely necessary, the effort of the will is what makes the difference. Uh, the sort of shifting one's feet out of the clinging clay, as it were. <clears throat> if you make the effort of the will, you may be able to go beyond the limitations of phenomenal existence. Um, I'm not saying you can, but you may be able to. And I think that that kind of goes back to Hoverbover's um, objection to, uh, or I wouldn't even say objection, but addition to what I'm saying. Life affirmation and life denial in and of itself is a snare. <laughs> or at least life affirmation versus life denial. Um, Siadvada. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, maybe it's inexpressible. <laughs> maybe it is and it isn't, and, you know, etc., etc. I'll leave a link to that as well. How to deal with axioms and uncertainty without being derailed into complete uh, solipsism or complete um, absolutism. One or the other. <clears throat> Maybe.